according to the book of Joshua, the first chapter, verse 9, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then from Psalm 27, the first verse says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold and my life. For whom shall I be afraid? Good morning and welcome to St. Luke Union Church on this uh, unique Sunday uh, as, as, we, as we worship um, well, in a sanctuary that is empty, but uh, with a congregation and a community that is, is gathered and joined um, through, uh, through the internet. Uh, so welcome to worship this morning. I, I pray that the, the Lord touches you, that, that uh, you hear what you need to hear this morning, that your prayers are answered, and that your spirit is filled as we worship today. I, I invite you to, uh, to join me in prayer as we, as we begin our worship. Holy God, why is it that we look but do not see? Bring us again and again into your light until your ways become visible to us and bear fruit in us. Touch us so that we utterly are changed, a before, an after, a now, and a then, that we may also say, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. In Christ's light we pray, amen. And now I invite you to sing along with us or, or simply listen as uh, Emma and Anna De Bruin and Doug and I uh, lead you all in the hymn Amazing Grace.
invite you to now uh, join me as I, I pray our prayer of confession. And it says this, Gracious God, we are people who still love darkness rather than light. We keep shameful deeds secret, but flaunt our occasional acts of virtue. We see ourselves as blameless, but pass judgment on others. We do not stand firmly enough with those who are vulnerable, but step back, protecting ourselves. Forgive us, we pray. Bring us into your light, that we may see ourselves rightly. Bring us into your light, that we may know ourselves loved. Bring us into your light, that we may live more fruitful lives. Keep raising us, we pray, from the deadness of sin, and shine upon us with your grace. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. I invite you to take a, a few moments of, of your own silent reflection. The psalmist assures us that God's goodness and mercy will follow us, even pursue us all the days of our life. As God's forgiven people, receive this goodness and mercy and live a new life in grace of Jesus Christ. We will live as children in the light that Christ shines upon us. time where we have a children's message, but I'm not certain if Reginald is here or not. Um, I do have some things perhaps I, I'd like to, to share with you all. I don't know. Is he here? Reginald, are you here today? Was that the secret knock? Secret knock. Hey! Where is everybody? They're at home. Oh, hi everybody at home. They're in um, sheltered in place lockdown. Hey, that's a good thing. Maybe that's something we should do. Right, right, exactly. To actually, to share a secret with everyone home, we're recording this a day before. <laughs> so we're good. We're good, right. <laughs> so hey, how are you? Patrick, I'm okay, but. But what? I'm still scared. You're scared? Mm -hmm. What are you scared of? Well, 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 they keep saying things and, and I, I feel like I'm out of control. Out of control? Yeah. Any more so than you normally are? Um, well, maybe just a little more than normal. Wait, wait, so why are you, why are you scared? And why are you nervous and out of control? Well, sometimes, well, they, they say some scary things, but Pastor Randy, I love to help people. That is true, mm -hmm. and you can probably help a lot of people because I don't think you're susceptible to the coronavirus. Oh no, they haven't known any puppets to get it yet. There are no known puppets that have been uh, 
have gotten the virus. But Pastor Randy, there are things I can't do anymore. Like what? Well, I can't go to my favorite puppet restaurant. There's a puppet restaurant? Mm-hmm. They have pastries. Oh, puppet pastries. Mm -hmm. Good. And, and Pastor Randy, I I can't go on a vacation, a puppet vacation. No puppet vacations. Where do puppets go on vacation? Uh, we go to the pastor's pasture. Pastor's pasture? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anywhere and, else? Well, and, and Pastor Randy, there are so many things I can't do. I can't I can't play with all my friends. Yeah, no. We, we need to kind of keep our distance from, from people, but what am I supposed to do? Thanks for asking. I bet you're going to tell me. I'm going to tell you. So we started this, um, this what I like to call the share and care plan here at church. Share and care. Right. Because what we I realized is that there's some people that have maybe a little extra. Oh. Like I have a lot of eggs. And I have a lot of socks. Right. Okay. So I thought that maybe there are people that might need eggs. I could share my eggs. Well, of course. Right, but some people, there are things that, you know, that they maybe have not, and they're looking for things. Maybe some people need eggs. Well, what are some other things that people might need? Well, it seems like everyone needs toilet paper. Oh, well, I might be able to find a roll and give it to someone. Right, maybe we could share a roll of toilet paper. Uh, okay. So what we're trying to do is, is if you need something, or if you have something a little extra, or if you're willing to deliver things to people who are basically sheltering in place. Maybe go grocery shopping? Right. We're asking everyone at church to contact Lisa Thornbush, our office manager, mm -hmm. and we're going to combine a spreadsheet. And we're going to put everything that people have extra of with everything that people don't have enough of, and we're going to spread it out. Oh, you know, that kind of reminds me of Jesus. Right. And, and he preached on the mountain. Yeah. And, and he says, bring me some loaves and fishes. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and then they, had, they thought they weren't going to have enough, all the disciples. Right. But guess what? What? There was plenty. And extra. And extra. So that's the share part. The care part is this. So there's a lot of people who, who live in, in retirement homes or who are, you know, who are in that category where they're a little bit more susceptible to the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And they're staying away from everybody. So oh, but they must be really lonely, Pastor Andy. Exactly. But you know what we still have? We still have phones we can call them on. We can still write them letters. We can send emails. We can do Snapchat. We can text. We can still make sure that they're okay. We can just call and have a conversation. Well, I think I'll call, but writing a letter might be difficult for me. Yeah, the thumb thing, right? No opposable thumbs. Right. Well, you can take Snapchats. Oh, yeah. I can talk to lots of people. Right. So I think we should reach out to everyone that, uh, that we know is probably maybe a little lonely. So if we have extra... Share. We, we can share, and if we can, if we need something, we, we can, can always let let us know. We can ask, and and then we can also care. We can care. We can write letters. Write letters, and if you need an address or an email or a phone number, again, if you call Lisa Dornbush or ask, talk to Lisa Dornbush, she will let you know who is on kind of our extra care list. And maybe we'll put her, her address, her email address in the in the Facebook thing. Right, exactly. Okay. Does it sound good? I think it's a very good plan. I'm excited, Pastor Randy. You're not scared anymore? No, there's lots for me to do. I know. Even if I'm here by myself. I can't wait to get a prayer card from you. <laughs> good luck reading it. All right. All right. Let's pray. How about if you pray today? I'd love to pray. Okay. God, God, Jesus, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's scary. And we don't know what to do. And we don't know what to do. Oh, but you're good. But you're good. And you give us ideas. You give us ideas to share. To share and to care. And to care for those for those that are around us. That are around us. Even around us in our virtual world. Even around us in the virtual world. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hey, let's do this thing. Right. Have I? Oh, elbow. Yep. Uh, okay. See you, man. Bye. Woo.
Someone always said it's hard to follow Reginald, and I completely understand. But uh, let's pray before we share scripture this morning. Gracious God, illumine our hearts and our minds as scripture are read and proclaimed, so that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may see what is good and right and true. And seeing, help us do what is pleasing to you, so that your glory becomes visible in our words and deeds. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have an Old Testament lesson today. It is from the book of 1 Samuel. And uh, we are going to start in chapter 16. We are going to read verses 1 through 13. So I invite you to turn to your own Bible, your own home Bible, to those verses. It's in the, the, the Old Testament uh, toward the front. Um, but this is the story of the anointing of David. And it goes like this. Here we go. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, do you have, have you come peaceably? He said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eli and thought, Surely the Lord anointed this, wow, this one now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, I do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look at an outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Anadadah and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. From that day forward, Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God invite you to, to listen to uh, the musical offerings of Anna and Emma. Scattered in 
we can certainly all say amen. The gospel reading I would like to share with you is from the book of John, chapter 9. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. And this is the, uh, the healing of the blind man. And it begins this way. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am that man. But they kept asking him, Then, how were your eyes opened? He answered. The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and then said, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this unique way to worship this uh, giving us the gift through technology to share your word and your way and to bring our community together. If it is a virtual togetherness, it is still that we are one in your spirit. Let these words, this music, let your scripture be um, to us your light. Let it touch our hearts that we can share and we can care for one another. Amen. Now, I have to say that this is kind of an interesting scenario here. Um, as I preach, um, there's a couple of things I'm, I'm worried about. If I tell a joke, I'm not really going to be sure if anyone laughs, so that's going to be awkward. And then there's no one in the back row right now, so I am not actually going to know if anyone has dozed off during this message, but I'm sure we will do uh, quite fine. Now, as I was preparing this week, what's all of the the news and all of the, the changing of what was going on, I thought initially that, that I was going to preach on the anointing of David. I thought, wow, this is, this is perfect. Because the, the act of anointing, especially in the Old Testament, was thought of to be healing. But then I turned and read the gospel for this, and I realized that, that if Jesus can heal with mud, well, healing was probably a better message and one that, that I would need to share. Now, I have to say that, that we are living well, in strange days. And when we talk about the days we are, are living in, the current days, we often say, well, remember the good old days? You know, the times back when things were more simple. Days when everyone would do things like walk to school, or kids would play outside, and they'd play games that, that they, they would make up. And they would make them up based on, I don't know, the, the limited sporting equipment they had or the configuration of the yard that they were playing in. I remember as a kid, we would play 16-inch um, softball with the neighbor kids, but the, the yard we played in was pretty thin. I will say, because of that, um, when we played softball, there were a lot of foul balls. But we did have a, a really big tree for first base. Um, second base was a hole. And third base, of course, was a fence post. But the best part about this yard was we did have a fence that we were, you know, we could hit home runs over. Quite nice. But it was also a time where there were there were no cell phones, there was no internet, 
At night, my family ate as a family after we offered and said grace. Um, in my family, you, the one thing you'd get in a lot of trouble for was talking back. You did your chores. You had homework that you did. Um, part of your allowance I, I, I was, was saved. Part of it was shared with the church I went to. And then after that, whatever was left over, I could, I could spend. I mean, it all sounds, sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds nice. It sounds simple. But I will say that there was also the bad side of the good old days. And the bad side, I see it as, well, perhaps that, that knowledge in medicine wasn't nearly what it was today. You may or, or may not know that, that my grandfather Gifford um, died after um, undergoing aortic valve replacement surgery in 1969. Now, that was part of the surgery that I underwent just two years ago. Now, my grandfather passed away because they couldn't stop his internal bleeding. While I survived the, the same post-surgery issue. Now, I started thinking about medical advances this week, and I went back and I looked at some of the crazy medical procedures people underwent and why, why they thought them to be effective. And I want to share a few with you. Okay, the first one, I'm sure many of you have heard this, was the, the practice of bloodletting. I mean, this is a crazy idea. But for thousands of years, people and medical practitioners believed that sickness of any kind was merely a result of bad blood. And I know where that term comes from. And if you just got rid of the bad blood, well, you'd be made well. People with fevers or other ailments were often diagnosed with an oversupply of blood. So in order to, to receive a balance, in order to, to get back to, to equilibrium in your body, you would go to a doctor, they would, they would simply cut into a vein and, and let out the appropriate amount, whatever that is. Leeches were also used in this practice um, if you had too much blood. And it's also thought that this was the thing that killed our first president of the United States, George Washington. Okay, there's another one called, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, trepanation. Uh, and this is actually what is thought of as one of the oldest forms of medical care. Dates some 7,000 years ago through, through archaeological digs. And this was the, the practice of drilling holes um, in people's heads to, as a means for, for curing illness. Now, some of the illnesses that prompted this technique were for mental illness, epilepsy, Headaches, of course, you gotta get that headache out of your head, so drill a hole in it. Or and it was also a way to, to get rid of evil spirits. What about mercury? Do you know that mercury was used as a as a as a, a, a cure-all for things? Mercury is a noxic, a, a noxious toxin, but it was considered an elixir and topical medicine for, for years. Quicksilver or, or red mercury sulfite was often drank can't believe this. It was drank because it was thought to increase one's lifespan or the virility. Some even thought it offered immortality. It was used until the early 20th century. It was most often used as a medicine to cure one of sexually transmitted diseases. Now, as strange as that sounds, it's, it's not really decided if that did help cure that disease, but we do know that most patients who drank, um, who drank uh, red mercury often died from, from liver and kidney failure. All right, I looked this up, I found this, there was a known as soothing syrup. Now this one actually um, was kind of known to work. And the reason it was developed, it was to ease the pains from our children found during adolescence. It was to, to help in the process of things like teething or colic or cramps or crankiness or just general disobedience by children. And as I said, I think it probably worked because if you read the label, this is what it was made of. Morphine, chloroform, coating, powdered opium, heroin, and not to be left out, cannabis extract. So of course your children would behave if you're giving them this. And then the final one I found it was the all unto the, the infamous lobotomy. The lobotomy. Now, lobotomy 
was a practice that began actually in the first half of the 20th century and was accomplished by, by taking instruments that resemble ice picks and driving them into someone's brain behind their eye socket. Oh, how horrible. This practice was thought to cure serious conditions like schizophrenia. It was also thought to cure mild anxiety and depression. Wow, I don't think I'd ever admit to, to a doctor that I was suffering from those and this is what was going to happen. Now, I found more of, of these things. I think, though, you can get the understanding that, that we have come so long, so far away, or so long in medical care. You know, so long, so far in helping God's most precious creation, human beings. So, with all that is going on, and as I share a message with, with each of you in a, in a sanctuary that is, well, it's empty. The lesson we read from John in that of healing, that of being made well, that of being forgiven of our past sins and our, and our mistakes. You see, the miracle of, of Jesus' healing of the man who was blind from birth, birth is a perfect example for what we are facing as we, as we battle this, well, this coronavirus. This gospel passage teaches us not only of Jesus' divinity, but also of, of, of that, of our light, or our life and our light. That he is both living water, that he is the, our light to eternal life. I want to think about this. As difficult as it is for us to imagine today of someone being healed by, by quack methods, the ones I, I have just shared, Jesus quite literally spits on the ground, gathers up the mud that he makes, shoves it into a man's eye, and cures him of blindness. But the difference that we have to understand is that even mud, even mud when placed in the hands of Christ, can and does cure the sick, cures the ill, even the blind. Jesus speaks and says in verse 5 from, from the reading from John, it says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Today, as we shelter in place, I think we need to begin seeking the presence of Jesus' activity in the world around us. It hasn't stopped. We need to share in the making of Jesus' miracles and bring about his light to all who find themselves in strange and difficult times. In our reading for today, I actually only shared well, the miraculous healing of the blind man, but the story goes on. I, I invite you to read it. It goes on through verse 37. The story of how a man who sat in darkness was brought into light, while on the other hand, the Pharisees, who thought they knew everything, who thought they were in the light, plunged themselves into darkness, teaching us that Jesus is the one who is the true light, who gives his light to everyone who puts their trust in him. Maybe this is what we, we all need to be doing, living in the light of Christ while, while considering our wellness and considering the wellness of others. But wellness, wellness is not just a thing, not a thing that is personal or corporate. You see, wellness occurs in relationship to God and needs to be an ongoing activity where I, I think there are two fundamental events occur. The first one is this. When we talk about wellness, we need to become aware of the factors which influence our health and our well-being. I think we, we've been taught that in it's been reiterated in the news as well. And then we need to, to make positive changes in our life where health and wealth and our well-being occur. But what you need to understand with what has been inundated in these in these last few weeks is well is that of simply uh, of disease prevention. When we look at wellness and what we're hearing in, 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 the, in the news is simply disease prevention. 
I even received, and to reiterate this, I, I, read, I received an email from my credit card company last week offering advice during this epidemic to pay my bills through electronic means while, of course, using my credit card, not writing checks. I thought, well, that was nice of them. But what I really think, what I really think we should be focusing on, not so much as disease prevention, but on life promotion. And here's what I mean. While wellness recommendations lead us away from illness, away from injury, and the spread of nasty germs, they should also lead us toward life that is more enjoyable, more productive, more energetic, more relaxing, more fulfilling, and most importantly, spiritually connected to God. Our physical and spiritual wellness cannot simply be a fad, but it rather needs to be our foundation. So when strange outbreaks such as the COVID-19 virus occur, we'll be in a better place. A better place not only to deal with the crisis, but to help others through it. I found a list of, of the leading causes of death in, in the world. And I want to share the top few with you. The first one is coronary artery disease. And many of you probably know this. And the reason people die of mostly of coronary artery disease is because of things like smoking or high blood pressure or elevated cholesterol or diet or diabetes or lack of exercise or, or stress, being overweight, and then heredity. The second leading cause of death in the world is cancer. Again, smoking is, is the cause of a lot of it. Diet, exposure, and, and heredity, just how you're made up. The third one is accidents. Maybe we wore our seatbelts more often, we would have less, um, we would die in less accidents, but I think it's also a little bit to do with poor judgment. We just judged better. We would not cause accidents or be in accidents. The fourth one is chronic lung disease. Smoking is, is another cause of that. The fifth one is where we find ourselves now. The fifth leading cause of death is pneumonia and influenza. The sixth is, is diabetes, caused by, by, well, it's often by weight, lack of exercise and diet. And the seventh one is, is suicide. Now, I read this week that when I looked at the leading causes of death, the most influencing factors in, in why people die is doctor, is what they classify as doctor, heredity, environment, and lifestyle. Doctor being, well, you go see a doctor and you're not feeling well, that they, they prescribe or they can care for you and make you well. The second one is heredity, meaning that when you're simply born with whatever is going to happen, you have more of a, a propensity to, to a disease. The third one is environment. Would be, well, that would be where one lives, perhaps including social, economic, family, work situations, and uh, however you're around, or whatever's around you. And then the fourth one, lifestyle, which is actually said to be, well, it cause at least 50% of the impact of, of our health chances. Now, within each of these influencing factors, there is one that I would say overrides them all and is the guiding factor to our health, to our happiness, to our well-being. And that is how God is a part of the wholeness of our lives and the lives um, who we live within God's created world. Now, I know this to be true because, because our lives are, are finite. And if we think that we can solve all of our problems and all of our crises by ourselves, we will we'll come to realize that we will always fall short. See, we need God the Creator. We need Jesus our Savior, and we need the ever presence of the Holy Spirit to see us through. Now, many of you know that, that my wife Sandy works as a dietitian at Advocate Broman Medical Center here in Normal, Illinois. For anyone who works in a hospital, they know that they are exposed to a lot more harmful things than, than the public does. 
I would say that Sandy is, is very good about cleanliness at home and at work. So much so that because she washes her hands so much that in the winter her fingers crack. And, and well, and in, at night when she goes to bed, she often wears mittens that have to, to hold the lotion on her hands to, to make them softer. You can imagine that, that she has been perhaps a bit stressed at the potential of bringing the COVID-19 virus into our home. And just last week, just last week, she was, she was exercising in our basement and after working out, she came up the stairs and explained to me what she was going to do amongst all of her preparation, amongst all of her cleaning, amongst all of her care. She told me she was going to simply hand over all that was going on to God in her prayer. She was going to combine, she was going to continue to pray for, for her family and her friends, but now she was going to offer specific prayers for the world, for all that were infected, for the doctors and the nurses and the researchers working to eradicate this virus. That she is now offering her prayer that God would come and remove this virus from the world completely. I think that's great advice. I think it's great advice because it centers God in our wellness plan. Now, I know that many of us are concerned about what is going on and what could potentially occur. And I know this because I've heard from a lot of you. But I want to share one last thing with you. One last thing that was shared with me. Nicole Southwick shared her daily devotional one day with me, and that devotional offers three things. Three things that we should be holding on to Three things that will help us remember our faith and what our faith brings during this time. And they're these. One, God has the power to heal the broken world. It's through God that we see that we are created, given life. It is through God that we are made whole. It was through God that Jesus used, I still can't get over this, spit to make mud to heal a blind man and give him sight. It's God who will heal the world and all the people he calls his own. The second thing is that if we fix our eyes on Jesus, it will lead to peace. In these times of trouble and stress, know that through our relationship with Jesus, we will be given peace. When we're, when we're talking and praying, Jesus continually sanctifies each of us, bringing us into the light giving us, but calling us to serve. He is giving us eyes to see. And finally, this, that the Holy Spirit remains all around us. The Holy Spirit is an interesting thing. The Holy Spirit, I don't know how to explain it, but it is like the wind. I mean, we can't see it. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it goes, but we can feel it. You can feel it on our faces when, it, when it's cold or when it's warm, when it's wet. We know that it's all around us. So be comforted knowing that you are surrounded in that presence. There is much to be concerned about. I understand that. There is much in our lives that has been upended, that has been put on hold. But, but go. Go knowing that God will make us whole, that Jesus will, will bring peace, and the Holy Spirit is, is all around us. Be at peace and be well. Amen. I think it is time for us to sing again. I will invite my large congregation.
To, uh, if you, you're not in the sanctuary, you don't have a prayer card, but I invite you to, to write a letter, to, to send an email, to send a text message to, to those whom um, you know would simply be lifted by a kind word, uh, a word of care. The, the prayer I want to share with us this morning is actually a prayer written by our co-moderators, the co-moderators of the, of the Presbyterian Church USA. And uh, let's pray together this wonderful prayer. Eternal God, sustainer, provider, God of all wisdom and knowledge, our spirits are weary, our faith quivers, our minds get clouded by news of sickness and death. You know our thoughts before we express them. Even the fears we dismiss, you know them. We cannot hide our feelings and worries from you. So as we are, we come to you, O oh God, asking for wisdom, for clear minds and open hearts, for calm and assurance that through the crisis you are present, knowing that the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. We ask for wisdom and protection for medical personnel, scientists, doctors, nurses, and laboratory technicians. For those around the world considering current and other health crises. For health care personnel and caregivers, we lift them up to you, Lord. We ask for clear minds and open hearts as people navigate daily lives. As closures and cancellations and quarantines are enacted, as families gather in their homes, 
some caring for those who are sick. As we encounter neighbors in our neighborhoods, stores and pharmacies, we pray for the sick, those who have lost, who are at risk of losing jobs in the midst of this crisis. For those whose health or social services we have or have been affected. For those suffering the direct effect of the virus locally and around the world. Illumine us, Holy Spirit. Show us in what ways we can be of help as we care for ourselves and for others. We ask for calm assurance, strength, and may we all remember that in the midst of any crisis, your grace reaches us, your hope enlightens us, and your love surrounds us. Lord, help us to share, help us to care, help us to be patient, not only with one another, but with, um, with your hand, with how we will eventually overcome. We ask that when we do see, uh, you see us through, that we come out stronger, that we come out more united, that we come out more caring, more loving, and more outreaching. Lord, hear our prayers, relieve the burdens that we hold so tightly in our hearts, fill our hearts with love, rain down your grace, and hear our prayers, not only the ones that, that I share, but the ones that every one of your children share. And let us pray together the prayer that your son taught us when we simply said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power, forever and ever. Amen. Now, strangely enough, when we worship, uh, when we're all together, this is a time when, when we go and we, we pass the offering plate. And um, we have an offering plate, but um, uh, obviously we, we're, we're, we're not able to pass it today. Um, this is just my, my request for all of you. Um, many of you have pledged to St. Luke Union Church. I would just ask that you, uh, uh, you keep current. We, uh, we do have bills that come in. We are still paying our staff. We are still trying to, to maintain our, our mission and our outreach. We are supporting the agencies that are helping the people in need around our communities. So please uh, uh, continue to to give your offering. If you are, are joining us and are not a member of St. Luke Union Church and you would wish to, to contribute, um, we would be grateful. Uh, and I would just ask to, to, to write or to sign, to send us uh, a contribution to St. Luke Union Church and it would be much appreciated. So, with that, as you think about that, I will invite uh, Doug to uh, come and sing for us uh, this morning.
if there's special announcements? None. All right. Uh, I do have one, though, that would be uh, too easy. Uh, so you are virtually worshiping with St. Luke Union um, today, and know that uh, the, the, ne the previous, the next week, we will be worshiping on the 29th this way, as well as on April 5th this way, and we will be making a decision based on, on what's taking place after that. We are, are not allowed to um, to be uh, uh, gathered as many as our six people who are here today helping lead worship. Um, so you are going to um, be uh, blessed with uh, sermons from the farm. Uh, I will be walking around and uh, giving messages um, from uh, from home. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like, but I'm pretty sure that there will be some sort of farm livestock involved. Um, so uh, you can, uh, we'll, we'll just go with that. I would say if you, if you want to keep up to date, look at the, the church uh, website, uh, stlookunion.org, or you can look on our Facebook page as well. We are going to try to be communicating with people um, that way, as well as messages through our prayer chain. Um, I do, again, encourage you um, to, to take place in our Share and Care um, a, a, a initiative. And if you have, uh, Lisa Dornbush is our, is our contact for that. So, let us sing our closing hymn.
So it is a interesting time, but uh, simply know that, that God is with us. God is guiding us. Christ will bring us peace and the Holy Spirit surrounds us. We will see this through. We will be made stronger. We will be brought together in the love and the grace and the peace of our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So may you be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Yeah.